kids. Good morning. How are we? Really good? Okay. So the kids want to tell you about clack. So what is clack? Kids, kids learning about Christ. Kids learning about Christ. And we meet once a month on the third Wednesday downstairs in the basement, right? And most all of, well, I think all of these kids that you see up here come on Wednesday nights. And we have fun, don't we? We sing, we dance, we learn about Christ, and they have worked on a special memory verse, and they want to share it with you this morning, okay? Are you ready? Okay. for just a minute so that's what we've been learning about for the last three months is prayer so when can we pray anytime you guys just shout it out okay where can we pray and what can we ask God for all right very very good and we want everybody to come to clack that can come it's for we actually have some kindergartners up through sixth grade and right now it's me and Miss Crystal and Miss Nicole. And if anybody is interested, because we think these kids are gonna go and find their friends and grow and grow, and we would love to have some helpers, okay? All right, you guys can go sit down today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you kids. And I believe CLAC is actually Sundays, right? Third Sunday. Yes, third, yeah, that's okay the third Sunday of, of each month at 6 o'clock. They meet at the same time the Bible study meets. And so, yes, we would love to have uh, more kids be a part of it, more, more volunteers. And so if you are so inclined, then you can see Miss Melanie or Dan, Crystal, uh, whomever that jumps in and helps down there. I'm sure we'd get you, get you in, in the right place. So good to see you, Nicole. So good to see you today on this Palm Sunday. And it's, it would be easy for me to, to stand up here and say, oh, I hope you're ready for Easter, and I hope that you are. hope that you're ready to, to celebrate uh, the, the risen Christ, and you should be. But that should be us every week, right? We should, we should come into this place together ready to, to worship the, the risen Christ. That's why we do what we do. If we gather here for any other reason, then we gather in vain, right? And so I say, yes, anticipate Easter, anticipate Resurrection Sunday, and yes, invite people to come to church. Because generally, Christmas and Easter, people are a little warmer to the idea of, of church. And they understand that those are, it's not about Santa Claus and bunnies. It's about Jesus. And generally, people will understand that. You know, if, if you say, well, Easter is about Jesus dying and raising from the dead, they know that uh, generally, right? But they've been, they have been deceived and they've been distracted from, from the truth about our holy holidays to believe it's, it's just it's just about warm fuzzies, and it's not. It's a very, very deep truth that we gather and we observe, we celebrate all the time, every day. So yes, be excited about Easter, but, uh, but really no more excited than, than you are every Sunday to gather together. And yes, invite people, because when you invite people to come to church, they're much more likely to come than if I invited them to church. So diligent in doing so. All right, we're going to continue with, with Romans today, Romans part four, if you're keeping score. 
and uh, today we're going to look at, at basically the same passage of scripture that we looked at last week, but a different a different message as we continue to talk about the the, the relationship that that Paul has with his with his readers and his his heart his heart's desire for them. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 8 through 12. And if you don't have your Bible, uh, I won't say shame on you, but I will say read off the screen. Uh, Romans 1, starting with verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and and mine. Thank you, God, for, for your word that transforms us, Lord. And I pray that it, that it has that, that perfect work, Lord, that as the, the word is read, as it is, as it is proclaimed and unpacked, if you will, Lord, that it will change us and it will conform us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I simply ask that you would use me today to convey your powerful truth. Jesus name. Amen. Well, we did leave off last week. I'm going to ask, can somebody go off? Would you grab me a glass of water? I'm running pretty dry today. Thank you. We left off last week uh, talking about Paul's sincerity in wanting to visit the church in Rome. And the text suggests that it was a, a, a deep yearning that he had to see them. Verse 11 says, for I long to see you. And most translations that you see use the word long, I long to see you. The amplified version uses the word yearn. I am yearning to see you. And that describes a a strong and uh, even an intense craving or need. So this desire or this this longing that Paul has that he expresses is not the same uh, expression that we might use when we when we see each other. Hey, it's good to see you. We'll see you next time, or we'll see you next week. You know, it, you know, I can look forward to seeing you and and you me, but maybe not with such a a, a deep yearning that Paul has to see those who were in Rome, and it's it's an it's very intentional. His desire to see them is its a deep, sincere desire. Thank you, buddy. <clears throat> Why was there such a, a, a deep desire? Why was there an aching in his, in his soul to see them in person? By, by any means possible. Well, to Paul, there was, there was nothing more important than the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus. And also, there was nothing more important than the results of the proclamation of the gospel. Because when the gospel is proclaimed, lives are changed. That's my desire, that's your desire, that was Paul's desire. And he gave his his every ounce, many times within an inch of his life, to proclaim the gospel and to to see all people everywhere come to Christ. Romans 1, 15 and 16, he says, So I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. In 1 Corinthians 1, 23, he says, but we preach Christ crucified. That's his message. In 1 Corinthians 9, 
22 and 23, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessing. So what does, what does the gospel do? In Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7, this is Paul speaking again. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heir according to the hope of eternal life. The word of God, the gospel, is that we are now justified in Christ. Justified, you could, you could say justification is, you just take the word justify. Just if I'd never sinned. Just if I'd never sinned against God. That's what justified means and who we are in Christ. Romans ten seventeen. so faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Faith, faith comes to the one who hears the gospel. And Paul wanted nothing more than for the gospel to be proclaimed for the salvation of all people by any means possible. And also for those who had received the gospel to be strengthened and rooted deeper and more firmly in the faith, that they would be more and more established in their faith. So can you say that about yourself today? Can you say that you want to be strengthened in your faith, that you want to be more and more rooted and established in faith and in your relationship with Jesus Christ? I long to see you, he says. He says, there's, there's an urgency in me to see you in person that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. And it's important for us to understand here that the spiritual gift that Paul talks about, the gift that he wants to impart to others, it's not, the, it's not the, the gift that comes from the, the laying on of hands that he did for Timothy, right? You look at first, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, he says to Timothy, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Or when we would lay hands on somebody in, to, pray, to pray for, for healing, when we would lay hands on somebody in sending them out, right, to do, to do ministry or whatever the case may be, we, we lay hands on as a, as a blessing to send. That's not the, the gift that Paul speaks of in Romans 1, 11. That the gift, the spiritual gift that he desires to impart and to share with them is the sweet gift of fellowship and encouragement. We need that. We all need that, that gift of, of encouragement and to see them in person to Paul would be a blessing it would be a blessing and an inspiration for him to, to get the opportunity to see them and also it would be a blessing for them to get to see him so who do you have who do you have in, in your life that maybe Maybe you don't get to see that often, whether it's, whether it's a family member that lives in another place in the country. And when you think of them, when you think of them, your heart yearns. You have somebody like that in your life? And I'll even add this, so many of us have people that have passed on. And when we think of them, our heart yearns to see them again and to be with them and what kind of reunion that will be when we, when we are able to, to see them again. Our heart aches 
it's a, it's an ache. And this is this is the, the, the experience that that Paul had in wanting to to finally see the people in Rome. You're a sight for sore eyes, we might say. And that's the way fellowship should be. Amen. That's the way fellowship should be. You know, you may or you may not receive a, a blessing when you see me and hear me preach. But I can tell you that I, I can hardly wait to get here on Sunday to see you. And it's such a blessing. It's such a blessing for me to, because I can stand here and I can see all y'all. Uh, in, 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 a, in a brief moment, I can see y'all. When I'm done, done there worshiping, I can't. You know, I'd, I'd love to be able to turn around just, and just watch y'all worship, you know. But it's such a blessing to see you and to know that you are my friend and that, and that, and that you trust me. You trust me with the gospel and that you trust me in leading this church. And it takes a lot of help, I can tell you that. It takes a lot of help. but I'm strengthened. I'm strengthened and I'm blessed to have you in my life. We get to, we get to eat together. That's great, that's great fellowship right there. We get to study God's word together. And when I learn something spiritually from you, that strengthens me. Recently during, during some of our Sunday night Bible studies that that we have. Oh, we have some very challenging and insightful conversations, don't we? We have some great conversations that can challenge us. And it causes us to, to stop and to consider the depth of the text and not just gloss over it in a hurry when we when we read it. How often do we do that? I don't understand that. I'll just move on. Right? I love these conversations that we have on Sunday night because we don't just gloss over them. We stop and we talk about it. And sometimes we talk about it for, for a while because, and I'm, I'm the first one that says, I'm not getting it. I don't understand it. So we stop. We talk it out. And that's, and we don't argue. I want to make sure you understand that. We don't argue. We have great back and forth conversation that helps us understand what God is saying. We need to do that because this is deep. This is deep stuff. This is beyond our, our mind's comprehension. It can be challenging. I love that process. I love processing what the Word of God says then to the point where we go, okay, I get it. That's a wonderful thing. Those, those aha moments in God are the best moments that you can get. Right? They are. And I thank Goff for his, his diligence and his, his hard work. In, in studying and putting it together to ask us these these questions and and uh, it's just it's a great time it's a great time and you know I can I, I do I read God's word and I, I study for myself and God gives me insight into it just like he does for you if you are reading and studying God's word if you're not reading it you're not studying it you can't expect insight because it takes diligence and it takes practice and it takes it takes uh, that's the word I'm looking for smart people perseverance that's the word I'm looking for thank you perseverance pressing in to be rooted and established and strengthened in our our faith and Paul's desire Paul's desire was to see the church in Rome in person. He wanted to impart the wisdom of God that he had received. He wanted to impart it to them for their benefit. 
but he also longed to be encouraged himself through what God was doing in them. So as your pastor, I'll ask you a few probing questions. What are you passionate about? What are you living for? What are you eager to do? Simple questions. Are you wasting your time? Are you wasting your life on things that don't matter? Or do you do you long to invest in others so that they will know Jesus? Gut check time, right? Two, two things will last forever. Two things. You know what they are? One of them is God's word, and the other is people. Everything else will fade away. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. The word of God. And I know that you know that everyone, everyone who has ever existed will, will live in eternity. Heaven for those who repent and call on Jesus, and hell for those who reject Jesus. But everyone will exist for eternity. So what are you doing in your life to focus on what matters most? Are you attempting to know and understand God's word better so that your relationship with others is beneficial to them? And that they also are a spiritual benefit to you or not. And it starts at home. Amen? It starts at home. But it, it should also carry over into work and into play as well. We talk about the unity that we possess here at First Baptist Church. What a beautiful thing it is. We possess it, we, we continue to, to pray for it, we protect it. Our unity is fed by our commonality in Jesus. We are servants of the same master, and we serve together in his kingdom. And by virtue of that, you should be more deeply rooted in faith. You should be encouraged to see me and hear me. And vice versa, my spiritual life should be enriched by time spent with you. And it is. And when we, we guys hang out, I love it when we guys hang out. There's nothing like guys hanging out. Ladies, you're not invited. <laughs> Do you want us at your meetings? No, don't want us at your meetings. <laughs> And you know, when, when we guys get together, it's not always an overtly spiritual encounter. Sometimes it's guns and grub. But in that, in that commonality, we experience the building of relationships. And the more time we spend together, the topics of discussion usually turn spiritual. Our guards come down because, you know, guys get together and we've got to spend the first however, however long, you know, shooting guns or whatever. I really don't do that. You, got, you know me well enough that I don't own a gun. But they let me shoot them. <laughs> And they all scatter. <laughs> Pastor's got a gun. <laughs> a 
But we, we've had some great conversations. The longer we hang out together, guards come down, struggles are shared, and men discover that when other men face the same struggles that they do, it can be very encouraging. Not alone in your struggle. And that's powerful. To discover that others go through the same thing, we need to hear that. And something, something great happens. That each one of us wants the other guys to be strengthened in their faith. Each one wants the other one to be more deeply rooted in Scripture and in faith. Amen, guys? We all need to learn how to love our wives better. Not more. I didn't say love, love you more. But we need to learn how to love our wives better. Maybe our biggest challenge of all. So in Paul's longing to see the church in Rome, did it happen the way that he hoped? Of course not, it didn't. But even towards the end of the book of Romans, his hope and anticipation was always to visit them, Romans 15, 32. So that by God's will, I pray I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. He did eventually go to Rome, right? He eventually made it to Rome. But not the way he expected. Because he arrived as a prisoner in chains. And he wrote Romans and he wrote First and Second Corinthians while on his third missionary journey in Corinth in about 57 AD. And it was shortly after that that he was arrested in Jerusalem and Paul would spend the final 10 years of his life in jail as a prisoner for the gospel in chains. So he arrived in Rome in chains as, as a prisoner in about 60 AD. And, and while in prison, while in prison, in chains, he wrote the books of Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, Philemon, First and Second Timothy, and Titus in prison. And in our journey to get somewhere that we long to go, or maybe even we feel God's calling and, and leading us someplace or to do something specific, God's idea of the journey may very well be different than our idea of the journey. Because we know that the closest distance between two points is what? A straight line. Where I am and where I think God is, is leading me in, in my mind is, is a straight line. I'm going to go straight there. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to be blessed. We're going to bless others. We're going to proclaim the kingdom of God. Oh, God will honor that, right? No bumps, no detours along the way. And the quicker, the better. Come on, God. Get on, get on this ride with me. You've probably heard it said, if you want to make God laugh, just tell him your plans. Proverbs 16, 9 says, The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Yes. And it's not to say that at times things won't go as, as hoped. especially as we desire to be aligned with the Word of God. God honors that. But there's always something in us that he wants to accomplish that requires a detour. It, requ it requires a valley. It requires a, 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 a cliff that seems insurmountable to climb. And that's where God changes us. That's where he... He, he challenges us in our, in our faith. That's the moments that we are more deeply rooted in his word. And 
and that we appreciate the journey. But Paul knew one way or another that he would make it to Rome to preach the gospel, to encourage the church. But I'm sure that making it as a prisoner in chains was not the way that he had it drawn up in his mind. But he was faithful to the very end. When he was near the end of his life, he wrote about it. I'm at the end. My life has been poured out. I'm ready to go. And he never considered his chains a hindrance to the gospel. Ephesians 6, 19 and 20, he says, Pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. In 2 Timothy 2, 8 and 9, he tells Timothy, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. So let's not let a, a hindrance derail us in our mission to share the gospel. Don't let a, a, a hindrance derail us from being an, an encouragement to someone else. But in your life, use, use the hindrance. Instead of woe is me, use the hindrance as a testimony of God's goodness and his faithfulness. And I believe every single one of us in here has that. We have a testimony to tell of God's goodness and his faithfulness in the midst, in the midst of the turmoil of our life. Don't look at it as a hindrance. Look at it as an opportunity to share the goodness of God in the midst of what you're going through because it will strengthen you as you endure and it will be a witness to others that you never gave up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for, for these moments that you, that you give us together to share your word and to to hear with open ears. And Lord, we don't, we don't speak them in vain. We don't speak them in eloquence. They are spoken as ordained by you for your glory to witness the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would, we would take these, these words and we would chew on them as we do a good meal. And, and Lord, we don't just put food in our mouth and swallow it. We chew on it. We, we, we enjoy, we savor the flavor. And Lord, I pray that the word of God is the same way. We listen, we hear it. And we savor it. We savor the word to understand it. And Lord, I pray that it changes each one of us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness, for your great love for us that was shown through the death, burial, and, and ultimately the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, dear God. And Lord, I pray that Holy Spirit would have this complete way during this time that as we are nudged and as we are drawn as we are reminded dear Lord we will know that is you that is you knocking and Lord I pray that we respond with yes Lord here I am Lord to do your will let us not only hear let us also pay attention and to do that which you ask us to do. In 
Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand?